So week after week, we come to church and we're reminded of who our identity, uh, of our identity in Christ and who we are. Uh, but until we begin to put the word into action and become doers of the word, we will never really know who we are and what we are capable of. You'll never know what you're capable of if all you're doing is hearing and hearing and hearing. Until you start doing, you'll never know what you're capable of and what your true identity in Christ is. Somebody say, God is good. God is good. Oh, Father, I just thank you for tonight. I thank you for the excitement that's in my bones. I pray, Father, that you would just... Open up our ears to hear. Help me to speak with clarity tonight. I thank you that you are God and that you're doing things in Saskatoon and around the world right now. And so, Lord, we we just call the uh, people in right now. We call people to be saved in Jesus' name. And we realize that for people to be saved, we have to go out and find people. And so, Father, we just uh, speak them to come across our path. We uh, pray for boldness and confidence to speak your word in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. I started a, uh, a message last week talking about 2019, bringing the word to life. This is the second message. Next week's going to be the third message. Uh, I, I've got, I started out with uh, when I was preparing for this with next week's message, but then it came into this. And then it just got way too long. So next week is uh, what I actually was <laughs> preparing to speak on this week. Uh, but the theme for our church and for you uh, as individuals uh, tonight, we welcome those joining us by Facebook and uh, on YouTube. And the theme for our church uh, is to bring the word to life. To bring the word and, and whatever Jesus says, whatever God says, uh, to life. How many know that whatever God says you can do, you can do? Okay, let, let, let's say that together. Whatever God says I can do. I can do. God. No, no, no. Let's say it. Whatever God says I can do. Whatever God says I can do. I can do. I can do. Awesome. Now, that's, do you believe that, though? Do you believe that? Our key verse that we're in is in James chapter 1 and uh, verses 21 to 25 and uh, there's a lot of good stuff in here, but what we're focusing on is uh, the implanted word and being doers of the implanted word. It says this in James chapter 1, verse 21. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, in humility receive the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. And so we said last week, the implanted word that is able to save your souls is Christ Jesus because we know that you can read the Bible and it points us to Jesus but the Bible cannot save your souls and so the implanted word is Christ so prove yourselves in verse 22 doers of the implanted word doers of the implanted word and not merely hearers uh, who delude themselves for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer he is like a man who looks at his natural face in the mirror for once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But the one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. That's our kind of key uh, whole passage for this whole uh, series of bringing the word to life. And I, I uh, like how it says there, uh, you know, if you look at yourself in a mirror and immediately if you go away, you forget, or if you're sorry, if you're not a doer, you forget who you are or you forget your identity. Many of us have spent lots of time in church. We know who we are in Christ. We know what we should be in Christ. But according to James, unless you do it, you really don't know your identity. Uh, it, it's uh, it's like I said last week. Uh, if you've got a carpenter, you've got somebody uh, carpentry work that needs to be done, and you got somebody that uh, has taken all the education. They know the bookmarks, and they they've done it all the books. And uh, then you've got somebody that may have not done all the book knowledge of being a carpenter, but somebody but for the last twenty five years has actually done carpentry. And you need a room built in your house, or maybe you need a house built. Who are you going to pick? 
Are you going to pick the person that has all the knowledge, that's heard what to do, they, they, but they've never done it? Or are you going to pick the person that's done it for 25 years, even though they don't have all the knowledge? And that's what James is saying is sometimes we, as Christians, we've been hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing. And, and some of us have been in church for 25, 30, 40 years. Some of you have only been in church for 14 years. Uh, but but uh, you've been in church and you're hearing and hearing and hearing. And you know who you ought to be in Christ. But according to James, until you, until you start doing it, you actually don't have that identity. You don't know your identity. It may be what you are, but until you do it, you're losing out on your identity. You forget who you are. He says, if you are not a doer, if you're sorry, if you're not a doer of the word and not a hear and not a hearer only, uh, it's like a man looking into a mirror, and as soon as he turns his face, he forgets who he is. It's, uh, I, I like fishing. Uh, and, and uh, you know, you can read up on fishing. You can do have every all the knowledge about fishing. You can buy a fishing rod, and you can have all the hooks. But how many know that until you actually go catch a fish, you're not a fisherman? All you are is a guy with a bunch of fishing stuff. That's all he is. Uh, <laughs> that's not what I is. That's maybe what you is. But you know, uh, you're not a fisherman until you actually go out and catch fish. So if we don't do the work, we forget our identity. So week after week, we come to church and we're reminded of who our identity, uh, of our identity in Christ, who we are. Uh, but until we begin to put the word into action and become doers of the word, we will never really know who we are and what we are capable of. You'll never know what you're capable of if all you're doing is hearing and hearing and hearing. Until you start doing, you'll never know what you're capable of and what your true identity in Christ is. Now, I got this question. Do you really know your capabilities in Christ? Paul writes to the Philippian church. I like this verse. In Philippians 4, verse 9, it says this. The things you have learned and received and have heard and have seen in me, practice these things. I like this. Paul, he goes off to Philippi, he starts a church, and then a little bit later, he's writing them a letter. And he's encouraging them, and he says, the things that you learned, the things that you received, the things that you heard, and the things that you have seen me do, if you heard me speak it, if you uh, saw me do it, practice these things. I'll tell you, Christianity is never supposed to be a spectator sport. <laughs> Yet so many times, that's what we've made it. We come to church once a week or maybe twice a week. We have Bible study and we hear and hear and we become spectators. And Christianity has never uh, been intended to be a spectator sport. We are all called to be participants because in us, in you, in me, is the life of Christ, the light of the world, the light, uh, the light of life is in you, the creator of the cosmos, uh, the authority of God is living inside of you. And then just a couple of verses later, in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, Paul says this. Remember, he says, whatever you have seen, or sorry, heard, received, and seen me do, practice these things. Then he says this. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me or gives me strength or who is my strength. I want you to know that when Paul was uh, writing the church in Philippians, he said, everything that you received from me, everything you heard from me, everything you saw me do, I want you to practice those things. And by the way, I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. You know, my mom used to just drive me absolutely wild when I was a kid. If I said the word can't, mom, I can't do that. You know what she'd say? She'd say, it's not in the dictionary. Can't's not in the dictionary. She says, can is in the dictionary, but can't is, I'd say it's a contraction, mom. It's for cannot. And both those words are in the dictionary. You know, but she'd always say, uh, you can, you can, you can. And so she always encouraged me. And uh, every time I said, I can't do that. I can't do that. She said, yes, you can. Uh, I want you to know tonight that yes, you can. Jesus says you can, so you can. When you think of the Apostles Paul's life, 
when he went to church, uh, start this church at Philippi, all the things that these people would have seen. They would have heard him preach the message of Jesus. They would have seen signs, wonders, and miracles taking place. And he says, practice these things. But more than that, do you know what I, I think more than that? They actually experienced the presence of Jesus. I think that when Paul went to Philippi, and just like tonight here in church, they experienced the presence of Jesus. I wonder how many times we've gone to church and we've talked about Jesus. The speakers got up and talked about Jesus, but we've never really experienced the presence of Jesus. And I think we should experience the presence of Jesus every day of our lives. 24-7, we can experience the presence of Jesus. But there is something special about coming in a gathering like this, coming to a church and just focusing our minds on Christ and experiencing his presence in the room, isn't there? I think there is. And, and that we should not, well, Paul says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Get together. Experience the presence of Jesus. I know that when Paul went to Philippi, people were being healed and demons were being cast out. And Paul began to speak with authority and they experienced Jesus. And Paul says, practice these things. The same Jesus who lived 2,000 years ago is alive. And he's here today doing miracles. You know, there was a miracle that happened last Thursday uh, when my father-in-law was kind of nudged by this bolt, something on his, um, uh, his shredder. There's a bar that came down and in his words were, that bar protected me from further damage. And, think, and I, we don't even actually know why that bar came down, but it came down and protected. It was a miracle that took place. I think we're looking for all these big things. We're looking for, you know, uh, uh, and we should look for big things. Uh, uh, healings and the lame walking and the dead coming back to life. But I think in order to get to that point, we need to thank God and look for every little miracle we see every day. What are those little things that God has done for you today? What are those little things that God did for you yesterday? And are we built from faith to faith to faith? And so we look at those little things. Maybe something, we've had testimony, something was lost. And all of a sudden, it's found. It's just like, wow, it just appeared out of nowhere. Uh, we looked there, but it, it wasn't there. Now it's there. We, these little things, and it's just a little miracle. Uh, whatever it is, maybe God supplied your need by his riches in, in glory in, in a miraculous way, and boom, it's there. We need to look for those little things to build from faith to faith. Do you know what's too easy? Let me ask, do you know what's too easy? It's too easy to let someone else do all the things we're supposed to do. I mean, you think about Paul. Paul went and started the church, taught them, showed them, but it would have been too easy for all those people in Philippi, when people came that needed healing and deliverance, to say, oh, we'll take you to Paul. It's too easy to let someone else do the things we're supposed to do. And so when Paul went to Philippi, he served the church, he taught them, he showed them, then what did he do? He moved on. <laughs> because as long as Paul was there, it was too easy for everyone else just to leave it up to Paul. Oh, Paul will do that. Let's take this person to Paul. And Paul moved on and it forced them to practice what they had been shown, what they had been taught. And I think that's a good thing. I think if you are being forced to do what you've been taught, what you've heard, what you've seen, and to practice that, it's a good thing. It's a good thing to be placed in a situation where you're forced to be uncomfortable and, and have, uh, to be the, have to be the person to do the works of Jesus because there's nobody else there. I think that is a great thing. And I, I, I should pray that for each and every one of you. Lord, put each person in an uncomfortable place where they have to do the works of Jesus because nobody else is there. Because what happens? It causes growth, doesn't it? It causes you to grow. It builds your faith. It creates your identity. Instead of having an I can't attitude, you have an I can uh, attitude. Because I can do all things through Christ. 
I don't need the pastor. I don't need that person over there. I don't need that crutch, that person to be my crutch because I can do it, and I've been forced to do it, and look what it, it happened. It's, it's okay. Now, I want to talk to you today about just one area that stops us from being everything God has created us to be and to do everything God says I can do. There's lots of things, but I want to just focus on one tonight. And it's this term we use today called self-consciousness or self-awareness. Now, I, I did this this morning. I did this with my wife and my sister-in-law the other day. And uh, I'm wondering what will happen tonight when I explain to you what self-consciousness looks like. So what I want you to do, everybody to stand up right now. Let's stand up, get engaged. All right, now, everybody standing up. Here, Kyle, standing up, right? Okay, here we go. For the next 30 seconds, I would like everybody to put your arms together and start walking around and start clucking like a chicken. All right, go, go. That's not 30 seconds, but the point has been made. Uh, this morning, do you know how many people did it? Zero. They looked at me and laughed. I had people going, uh-uh, that ain't gonna happen. You can sit down for a second, all right? Does that mean we win? Uh, no, yes, we do win. Uh, there were some people here that were like, hmm, no, I'm not gonna do that. Uh, that right there, is self-consciousness. I want you to think that about someone off the street that could have walked into the church right then and seen everybody clucking like chicken in Saskatoon and all of a sudden, uh, it's on Facebook now, yeah. Uh, uh, and, but somebody walks in, sees our church clucking like chickens, what do you think they would go out and say? We are so worried about our reputation. That is self-consciousness, and self-consciousness causes fear. Let me uh, just put a, uh, give you an illustration here. When I was 18 years old, I went on this group called Life Force. When I was on Life Force, there was two teams. There was the first ever Life Force team. There was the proclamation team, and there was the drama team. I wanted to be on the drama team. I actually went down there. I wanted to be on the drama team. Do you know what they did to us? They put us all in a little room and they told us to do stuff like that. I want you to walk around the room, all of you, and cluck like chickens. And then they'd say, okay, everybody's a snake. You're a snake now. And oh, oh, everybody's an elephant. And do you know what? I got kicked out of the drama team and put on the proclamation team because at that time in my life, I could not shake the self-consciousness uh, of how silly I looked, and I couldn't do it. I never made the team, because I was so self-conscious. Now, and self-consciousness creates fear. It freezes us. Now, think about Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve are living in a beautiful garden, and they're absolutely unaware of any evil, they're unaware of any bad, they look everywhere and it's good. And then something happened, they were even naked and they were unaware that they were naked. And then they ate this fruit and the scripture says this, and their eyes were opened. And when you do a little bit of digging into this, what that really means, their eyes were opened, they became self-conscious. All of a sudden they looked at themselves and realized they were naked. They were naked before and it didn't bother them, but they became self-aware and self-conscious. And what did they do? They went and hid. God comes down and walks in the garden. Adam, where are you? I was naked and afraid. Who told you you were naked? All of a sudden, I became self-conscious. You see, the, the deception of the devil was this. 
He said, if you eat this fruit, you will know what it's like to be God, know what the difference of good and evil is. But the moment Adam and Eve ate that fruit, do you know what they realized? They realized how much they were not like God. And they became self-conscious. And they became self-conscious and it froze them and it placed fear in them. Their self-consciousness caused them to become afraid and hide. And all of us experience that. I, I don't know what you're like when you're at home, you know? Maybe you're at home and when nobody's looking, you've got the broom or the mop and you're singing away and dancing with the broom and the mop and all of a sudden somebody comes in you're like, whoops, wasn't me. <laughs> you know, a uh, little blushing there. Because all of a sudden when somebody sees you, you become self-conscious and you freeze and it creates fear because what will somebody else think about me? Self-consciousness. I should say this first, is that we all have it. What do you guys do when you're home alone and nobody is watching? Do you get in your shower and just sing your brains out when nobody's listening? Do you, what are those things that you do when nobody's watching that the moment somebody sees you, you freeze up, you don't want anybody to know? See, self-consciousness is not so much about what we think about ourselves, it has to do with what we think others will think about us. We wouldn't want others to think we're weird, <laughs> would we? Well, you already know I am, so I don't care, you know? <laughs> I wouldn't want others to think well, I'm, I'm weird, I wouldn't want others to know, you know I'm self-conscious. The truth is, is that in the privacy of your own home, when you're with nobody else, maybe in your car or whatever, you're all weird. <laughs> we all do things that nobody else really knows about that we enjoy. We get, you know, an enjoyment out of it. We wouldn't want others to wreck our reputation. See, self-consciousness, keeping our reputation will freeze us from doing the things of God. Self-consciousness is a faith killer because self-consciousness freezes you with fear. So somebody comes up to you and says, I need prayer. And you're like, oh. And it freezes you. You're like, oh, I don't know if I pray so good. I should probably get somebody else to pray because they pray better than me. And all of a sudden, you're conscious about how you pray. Does it really matter? And if we're going to bring the word to life, the first thing we have to get over is ourselves. If we're going to bring the word to life, the first thing we have to get over is ourselves. We have to overcome fear and we have to speak the word with boldness. Now, I want you to go over to Acts chapter four. We're gonna close with this little portion tonight. Acts chapter four, and I, I love this little portion here. In Acts chapter three, Peter and John are on their way to the temple. They see a lame man. Uh, Peter, he's asking for alms, and Peter says, I don't have any money, but what I'm gonna give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. Could you imagine how unself-conscious Peter must have been in order to bend down, reach down, get that guy's hand, and pick him up in front of all these people that are watching, the boldness, the authority that he had right then. He didn't care who was watching. He didn't even care that the man wanted to be healed. He says, what I have, I'm gonna give you in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. Then they're taken and they're kind of uh, taken before the religious leaders and they're uh, told not to preach in the name of Jesus anymore. They were baffled. It says in, in uh, Acts 3, when these religious leaders saw that they were unlearned men, they were amazed, and they let them go, and uh, they told them, don't speak anymore in the name of Jesus. But their boldness was, Peter, Peter says to them, you guess what? I, whether we listen to you or God, you, you determine which more important, but uh, we cannot stop speaking 
in the name of Jesus. So they go and they find this prayer meeting. And in this prayer meeting, they start this prayer. And I'm going to pick it up in verse 29. It says, and now, Lord, take note of their threats and grant that your bond servants may speak your word with all confidence. While you extend your hand to heal, and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak the word of God with boldness. Now, I just love this. He, the, the prayer that they prayed is this. God, grant us to speak your word. I think in the King James it says, with boldness. In the NASB, it says, with confidence. When's the last time you went uh, into your prayer and, and you said, God, I want to speak your word in confidence. Grant it to me that whatever situation comes up, I would be bold enough to proclaim it. I would be confident enough to speak your word. I think we need a prayer meeting like that. Lord, grant us to speak your word with all confidence. And then it says, while you extend your hand to heal, and you do signs and wonders through Jesus. These disciples, they prayed to speak the word with confidence. And then they said, uh, as you continue to heal and do signs and wonders. Now, there's that word confidence. But I, I want to focus on this little word tonight to speak. Speak. It's good to, have, to think about confidence. It's pray, Lord, uh, let me comp give me confidence. But there's this little word I want to focus on as well. It's called speak. We need to speak God's word. We need to let it out of our mouths. We need our voices to be heard. Like we say to toddlers, use your words. What do you want? Uh, 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 uh. No, use your words. You know you can use your words. I actually think it is very beneficial for all of us to pray out. And, uh, Paul says this, I pray in a language that I understand, and I pray in tongues also. We let those words out now, I, and use our words. Now, I want to share with you just a little revelation God showed me about words this last week. I, I was, I can't remember if it was Tuesday or Wednesday or whatever, and the Holy Spirit said to me, Kevin, do you know why speaking words has power? And I'm saying, well, the life and death is in the power of the tongue. The Bible says words have power. And uh, the Holy Spirit said to me, well, that's not wrong. That's not right. <laughs> that's not what I'm looking for. It's not the right answer. And here's what God spoke to me. The reason words have power is because they have to come out with breath. Let me explain that. Have you ever tried talking while inhaling? Hi, how are you today? You know, it doesn't come out very well. Have you ever tried talking? I actually sat down this week and tried to do this without exhaling or inhaling. You can't do it. It takes breath. Now, here, here's the key. In the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Think about this. In Genesis chapter 1, it says, And the earth was formless and void, and the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. Do you know that the word Spirit in the Old Testament and in the New Testament means a current of air, a breath, a wind? That's why when the, the, the disciples are uh, uh, in Acts chapter 2 and the Holy Spirit comes in, he comes in like a mighty rushing wind, a current of air, a breath. I want uh, you to know tonight that your words have spirit behind them. Jesus, or I should say God, uh, you know, Jesus comes to, uh, in the Garden of Eden and he speaks. John 1.1 1, 1 says the word you know, was in the beginning with God and all things were created by the word and so it was spoken into existence and then God comes down forms man out of the dust and then what does he do he breathes on them there was power in the breath because the spirit is in this breath that comes out the, the words that uh, God spoke in the beginning were powerful because he spoke them out with his breath the Holy Spirit doing all the work 
When Jesus is with his disciples, he takes his disciples on them and he breathes on them and he says, receive the Holy Spirit. There is something powerful when you speak the words. That's why uh, the, the scripture says, life and death is in the power of the tongues. You know, if you say to somebody, I love you, there is a spirit that comes out in, those, in, those, in your breath. And uh, all of a sudden, somebody, whoever you're saying that to, they, they connect with that. There's something that hits them. It's not just the words. It's because it's the spirit, the breath. If you say to somebody, I hate you, the same thing happens. <laughs> Except opposite. They feel that spirit coming out of you. It's in the breath. And, uh, uh, and the breath make our words come alive. You can't talk without breath. And it's the breath that makes your words come alive, which is so, why it's so important to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I think it's even important that we uh, uh, speak in other tongues. That when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we begin to speak in tongues because what you're doing is you're speaking words that you might not even understand. And all of a sudden, the breath that's coming out of you is giving those words life. It's, it's bringing those words to life. It's the spirit. It's the breath. Isn't that awesome? Does that make sense to you? The Holy Spirit is breath. Oh, I, I, mean, I just love that. So here's my challenge for you today. What are you speaking? What comes out of your mouth? Your breath brings life to your words. Then will you begin to speak the word of God with all confidence? You might say, I've never done this before but I'm going to do this now. Next week, we're going to talk a little bit about prophesying and uh, uh, just sharing, God sharing with me today uh, or this last week and even more today, I guess, about prophesying and that you can actually prophesy. We think this, we think this. We think that we need to, you know, get in prayer and just close our eyes and get a word from God to speak to somebody. And there's something to that. I, I, there's absolutely something to that. I, I love it. But you know what is prophesying to somebody? I declare over each and every one of you this year, 2019 is going to be a year of abundance. Amen. So be it. I just prophesied to you. I spoke those words. Uh, they've taken breath and the spirit makes them alive. Now, I, I, I totally believe in personal prophecy and God giving us words for uh, certain individuals at certain times and stuff like that. But every time you say, I just want to encourage you in Jesus' name, you're actually prophesying. Your words are coming alive. They have breath behind them. The spirit is in them. And you're prophesying. We've never thought about it that way before. But you can prophesy. Will you begin to speak the word of God with all confidence? Will you get to a place where your reputation doesn't matter? Your self-consciousness doesn't matter. I, I asked you to cluck like a chicken tonight. That's nothing to what God called some of his prophets to do. He called one of them to lay on his side for like a year uh, on the middle of the street. He said, oh, by the way, I'd like you to make a fire out of your own dung. The guy, God, the prophet said, oh, wait, 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 that's unclean. God says, okay, make it out of cow's dung. And then when he was finished, God said to him, oh, I want you to lay on your other side for another half year. I tell you, you lose all your self-confidence, uh, your self-consciousness then, not confidence, self-consciousness. Because you're doing what God is saying. You're not, uh, you're not caring about your reputation. You're not caring about what you look like. It's God, what have you made me? In Acts chapter four, they prayed that they might speak God's word with all confidence. 
At the same time, God was doing miracles. He was doing signs, wonders in the name of Jesus. And they were shaken. There's so much there, but I can't get into it. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. What's that spirit? Breath. They were filled with the breath. And when they were filled with the breath, they began to speak the word in all boldness. Are you filled with the breath? You really are. But are you letting that breath come out of you? Confidence begins with being filled with the Holy Spirit or God's breath and having a relationship with God who is in you. And when you know who is in you, you'll be able to speak with confidence and all authority because as long as you're self-conscious, it will freeze you. When I was a teenager, there was a problem with me that froze me. I had terrible acne. So terrible that, you know, I, so terrible that I could not talk to a girl that I liked, or a pretty girl, if, even if I didn't like her. Because all I could think about is that this girl is looking at me and all she can see are my zits. I was so self-conscious, it froze me. Not just from a relationship with a female, but relationships with others. Because I was so self-conscious. I think God's saying, I want you to lose that. Self-consciousness came by eating the fruit. And they froze and they hid in fear. Self-consciousness will cause you to walk in fear and not faith. We've got a song that I want you guys to just sing for closing. Somebody, uh, can, can, can you identify with that tonight? Can you say, man, I can see some places where maybe I've been a little bit self-conscious. Self-consciousness freezes me, causes fear to rise up within me. I'm not walking in faith. Uh, I, I feel God saying, hey, you should talk to this person, but I don't because I'm self-conscious. What, what am I going to say? Who am I? This person does it better. Folks, I want to release you of that self-consciousness that came from eating the fruit in the garden. Jesus came to deliver us from that self-consciousness, and he says, it's not you anyways, it's me in you. As long as you focus on you, you ain't going to do anything. But when we focus on Jesus, all of a sudden, signs, wonders, miracles, things begin to happen. We see them in our church. We see them in our lives. I, I, I just love sitting down with people and hearing their stories. Let's get rid of that self-consciousness and start living in faith.